everybody, and welcome to uh, OSU Extension Agronomic Props Team's first ever virtual corn college and soybean school. I'm Mary Griffith, an Extension Educator in Madison County, Ohio, and I'm one of the Agronomic Crops team leaders along with Amanda Doritas and Laura Lindsay, and the three of us will be mo uh, moder moderating throughout uh, the day. So thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thanks for joining uh, for the second half of our program. Uh, we're going to turn our attention uh, now to soybean. Uh, so I'm Laura Lindsay. I'm the soybean and small grain extension specialist here at Ohio State. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we have several soybean specialists, including uh, Dr. Mark Laux, who will be talking about weed management in soybean, uh, Dr. Ann Dorns, the soybean pathologist, and Dr. Kelly Tillman, who is uh, going to focus on insect management in soybean. Great. Well, i um, really happy to be here today. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been here at Ohio State. Um, at, I'm at the OARDC station in Worcester. I've been here a little over five years now. Uh, I cover field crops generally, but a lot of my work is in corn and soybean. We also do some work in uh, wheat, uh, we do some work in cover crops, and uh, we do a little bit in alfalfa, but most of my work is in that corn and soybean area. And my talk today is, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of a back to basics talk. I'm gonna be talking about insecticidal seed treatments, so what you can and can't expect from them. And I say that this is a back to basics talk because we've all, been working with seed treatments and using them for a long time. We think they're just kind of part of our background a lot. Uh, we don't really think a whole lot about what's going on with them, but there's a good reason to reconsider insecticidal seed treatments and carefully consider what they do or don't do for us because uh, they are an input cost. They do cost something as I'll show you. And we really need to consider things like, are we getting value for money? And I'll kind of jump to the main message of this talk right now, which is in some cases they provide good value for pest control, in other cases they don't. So if you're really looking at your bottom line, this is an area where you can consider whether you're getting your money's worth out of it. So I'm going to go over uh, a review of what are insecticidal seed treatments, how do they work, uh, how long are they effective in your field, and this is very important because this goes towards the question of what pests do they most successfully control. So we've been working with insecticidal seed treatments as growers, as crop consultants, as researchers for a long time. These uh, lovely candy coated uh, kernels of goodness. And uh, I, I am specifically talking about insecticidal seed treatments in this talk. I, often insecticidal seed treatments are bundled with fungus so what I'm talking about really applies to the insecticide component, not the fungicide component. The fungicide is a, a whole nother issue. And even though I'm in the soybean section, a lot of what I'm going to say today applies uh, equally um, to corn or soybean both. So these seed treatments uh, go on with the seed coat and then they get taken up in the plant tissue as the plant germinates and grows. And this is very, a very convenient way to have insecticide for a couple reasons. It's very easy to handle because it's just on the seed. Uh, you don't have the additional application costs of having to go over the field with a special insecticide application. But one of the disadvantages that we don't think about all the time is that they actually have a fairly narrow range uh, window of protection. And I'm gonna go over some data to show you that in a moment. So uh, does my um, pointer, can you see the pointer moving around? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm never sure whether that shows up or not. So just uh, briefly to illustrate how this works, it goes on with the seed coat. As the plant germinates, the product gets into the vascular system, the system that moves water and nutrients throughout the plant. It gets in and then it gets moved into the plant as the uh, plant grows and develops. So the actual product is being moved through the vein system of the plant, if you will, uh, to get to the new plant tissue. But here's the catch with that. The amount of 
active ingredient is finite, it's limited. It is limited to what goes on with the seed coat. And the plant does not generate more. Once this product that goes with the seed is gone, it's gone. And I'm emphasizing this because this is contrary to what we uh, experience with Bt protection in plants. Bt is a genetic component of the plant. It is produced by the plant cells. And so as the plant grows, each new cell um, is born, if you will, with the capacity to generate more Bt toxin. So as the plant continues to grow and develop it, all the new tissue that gets added has at least the capacity to produce new Bt toxin. So uh, that is different from the seed treatment situation where uh, it is an actual physical thing that when it runs out, it's gone. So there are different types of insecticidal seed treatments. We have the most commonly used class are the neonicotinoids. So this is uh, the products, familiar products like Goucher, Gaucho and Cruiser and Poncho. And then we have other, uh, another class, the anth anthranilic diamides. So an example of this is Lumivia. But by far most of the products of seed treatment are the neonicotinoids. So a neonicotinoid is a version of nicotine, the kind of nicotine that is in cigarettes. Neo means new, nicotinoid means a type of nicotine. And nicotine is in tobacco because it's there as an insecticide. The, the tobacco plant uses this as a defense against insect feeding. And so scientists recognize this and they said, well, wouldn't it be neat if we could make our own, uh, manufacture our own artificial nicotines and use that as an insecticide. Uh, these are uh, good insecticides from uh, many points of view. They're potent neurotoxins. Uh, they act on the insect nervous system and they have a fairly low toxicity to vertebrates. Now that's as a pesticide. So if you covered yourself in nicotine juice, um, you would probably be okay. Um, whereas if you smoke it for 30 years, not so much. So we're talking about external application. Uh, most of our field crops, up to 90% of corn is treated with a neonicotinoid seed treatment. Uh, one estimate I've read is that 60 to 75% of soybeans have an insecticide neonic seed treatment. Um, I suspect in some areas it's even more than that. And then other uh, crops, canola, wheat, cotton, very common, commonly used in those settings. Now, what is the price of having an insecticidal seed treatment? Now, that's gonna vary, of course, depending on your package that you have, what kind of bundle you have, what kind of purchase volume, what kind of deals you have with your dealer, et cetera, et cetera. But a good ballpark average of the cost of the insecticide component of the bundle. So this is the cost just for the insecticide part of a bundle. So if we're talking about Cruiser Max, where Cruiser is the insecticide and the Max pertains to the fungicide, we're just talking about the cost for the Cruiser part of that, for example. On average, kind of ballpark figure, $7 an acre is what it costs you to have the insecticide component of the seed treatment. So $7 an acre, that's real money, and that adds up if you're running a lot of acreage. And so it's important to consider how long is that investment in effective as an insect control. So first I'm gonna show you some data from corn and then from soybean. And considering uh, this corn, we've got, I'm gonna be talk, showing some data on the insecticide concentration that we find in the roots, in the seed body, and in the shoot. So in this chart, we're looking at the percent of the original active ingredient that goes on with the seed that we find in the corn plant tissue certain number of days after planting. So we take the corn, corn apart, we look at right here, we're looking at the root tissue and we take the root tissue apart different plants, we look at them at five days after planting, 10, 15, and 20 days after planting, and we're looking at how much of the active ingredient we're finding. The circles are a high rate, and this is, um, this is, uh, uh, 
boy, I just blanked on which. This is, I think, Poncho, yes. Uh, so this is a high or initial high rate uh, are the circles and initial triangles are the low rate of the product. And what you can see here is that at we start to really start to go down in the high rate at about 10 days after planting. And this is the tissue in the, uh, the product that we find in new root tissue. And by 20 days after planting, we are actually fairly low concentration in the roots, uh, close to zero um, in the case of the low rate and not much above 0.02 in the case of the uh, high rate application. So now this chart is looking at the concentration that we see on the seed. Again, we have pretty much bottomed out to zero at 20 days after planting. And then in the shoot, uh, we've also gotten down between zero and 0.1 in both the low and high rate at 20 days after planting. So moral of the story here, whether you're looking at root, seed, or shoot, about 20 days after planting, we are running out of product. This is a similar type of analysis looking at soybean vegetation that I was involved in, looking at the concentration of thiamethoxam, that's cruiser, in terms of days after planting of the soybeans. We uh, see uh, an increase in the beginning as that product is translocating to new plant tissue, but very soon after that, <coughs> we see a rapid drop off in the concentration. And we've pretty much bottomed out at around 19, 20 days. We uh, are not finding the cruiser in the new soybean vegetation uh, 20 days after planting. So more or less, bottom line here is you've got about three weeks of protection after planting with an insecticidal seed treatment. After that, uh, any new plant tissue that's added after that point is going to lack product inside of it and is going to lack protection. So uh, pardon me a moment, I have to cough. So I'm going to take off my headset here. <laughs> okay, so three weeks of protection. Which insects uh, will three weeks of protection be useful against? Now there are some insects where that critical period really is three weeks into the planting cycle. Uh, white grubs are one such group of insects. There are different species that we can uh, categorize in this. We, we've got Japanese beetles, rose chafers, june beetles. Now, Asiatic garden beetle, which is a pest that some people in the northern tier of Ohio, particularly with people with sandy soil, deal with. This is a white grub, but seed treatments are not very effective uh, against Asiatic garden beetle. But these other white grubs, yes, um, they are already in the ground when the corn is planted, and they attack those new little roots of the corn plant. And so, uh, within that first three week window, a lot of damage can occur. Uh, this is particularly a problem in corn, but I actually have also seen damage in soybean as well. Uh, what you, the type of damage you will observe is uh, that you get stand loss and uh, gaps in your rows after the roots have been fed upon and the plants wither and die. Uh, so this picture so, shows how some of the roots have been pruned by these white grubs. Uh, often the stem will turn purple and the leaves will turn purple. And if the roots have been badly enough damaged, the plant will die. Or if not, it might survive, but just never thrive or grow very much. Wireworms. This is another pest, early season root pest, against which insecticidal seed treatments can be effective. So here we have a root pruning that was caused by this long skinny wireworm. And here's a better picture of a wireworm. This is a white grub on the left and on the right inside of the circle is this wireworm. From the top, from the surface, it causes a very similar type of damage uh, where you get stand loss because of the effect of, of killing the, the plant from feeding on the roots. 
There are several different species of wireworms that we have in Ohio, and they're not all interchangeable. They, they do have some different biology. Some of them have a three-year life cycle. Some of them have a four-year life cycle in the soil. Some of them even have a five-year life cycle in the soil. Uh, the, depending on the species, the insecticidal seed treatments might be more or less effective. And so if you have wireworms, it's important to try to get a good species ID so you know what you're dealing with and can choose the best products. Seed corn maggot. This is another one where it's particularly effective with an insecticidal seed treatment. This is something that can affect corn or soybean or uh, even even wheat under the right circumstances, um, if it's spring wheat, which actually we don't really grow in Ohio, so never mind. So this is actually the larva of a type of fly. And these flies are attracted in the uh, early season to decaying organic matter. And so they fly around and they find the fields that have really nice decaying organic matter and that's where they lay their eggs in the soil. Those eggs hatch into these little uh, grub-like larvae, these little maggots, and those maggots feed on the seeds, typically of corn or soybean. And so they have a very early window of damage. And because they have an early window of damage, we found seed treatments to be pretty effective against them. Now, this is a pest that is most likely to affect um, people who uh, ha are disking in uh, green matter if they're uh, disking in a cover crop um, or if they're applying manure. These are things that provide that nice rotty organic matter. And in fact, when I'm doing seed corn maggot trials and I want to encourage a seed corn maggot infestation, I will disk in alfalfa um, and then plant 10 days after. 10 days is kind of just the right level of rottiness. So here's a, a trial where on the left we have a seed corn maggot damage from untreated seed. And then on the right we have uh, plots that were treated. And it's, you don't have to do a lot of math or statistics here to see the difference in the protection that the seed treatment is giving you against the seed corn maggot. So I particularly recommend if you're somebody who spreads manure or if you um, disc in cover crops, uh, this is something you might want to consider. Now, that's what insecticidal seed treatments tend to be good for. Uh, what they don't tend to be good for, or at least by what I mean is good, is it providing return on your investment? Is it really controlling the pest to the level where you're getting your money's worth? And the answer is generally speaking, anything that's a problem a month or more after planting, not so much. Now, people always ask me about bean leaf beetle. They say, well, bean leaf beetle can be an early season pest of soybean. It can get into the soybean seedlings when they're still really small. Is an insecticidal seed treatment effective against bean leaf beetle? Well, yes, but here's my caveat. So these beetles uh, overwinter as adults, and as soon as the soybeans come up, they may come in and start feeding. And if a plant has been treated with that seed treatment, it will kill the bean leaf beetles. But the caveat is that almost always that early season feeding from bean leaf beetles is simply cosmetic. It creates some holes, it looks a little ratty, the soybeans outgrow it, the soybeans compensate, you'll never know the difference by the time it comes to harvest time. So is it worth $7 an acre to control a problem? It's probably not even really a problem. Now on the off chance that you had just a just epic bean leaf beetle infestation one year out of 10, you can still apply a foliar. You know, that's always an option. It's very easy to apply a foliar insecticide against adult bean leaf beetles if you were in the rare situation where you felt you needed to. So consider whether that, that insurance of having insecticidal seed treatment against bean leaf beetle is really adding up to cost savings for you. Other beetles that the seed treatments are flat out not effective against, uh, Japanese beetles, foliage feeders, so these are a lot of the caterpillars. Uh, we, these are things we see later in the summer. These are things that we start seeing in July. That's long after planting. 
seed treatment's gone, not effective against these critters. So these are various caterpillars, grasshoppers, beetles that are chewing holes in the leaf from midsummer onward, mainly uh, an issue in soybean. Uh, there was a big push, particularly a few years ago, that seed treatments were, uh, this was a push that was coming um, largely from industry, that seed treatments were a good defense against soybean aphids. Well, I have been involved in a lot of research on this topic, and the basic answer is no. And why? Because it's about timing. In this graphic here, uh, we have the different vegetative growth stages and then the flowering stages and the pod stages of soybean. This triangle represents the decreasing concentration of the seed treatment in the soybean plant. So the soybean plants are only hot for a narrow window. And then this swelling mountain shows when soybean aphids are coming in and being a problem in soybean. So this period here from basically R2 through R5 is the danger zone for soybean aphid long after we've petered out with the neonicotinoid seed treatment. Okay, uh, this is an interesting story about slugs that I'm gonna go into, but I think I'll pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions to this point. I don't see any questions, Kelly, but I just will remind everybody, if you do have questions, um, you can type those in the Q&A and we'll, we'll have a little time at the end to get to those. Okay. So slugs are an early season pest of both soybean and corn, particularly for, uh, particularly for no-till growers because the tillage the, no, the, the, the lack of tillage and the high residue provides a nice, um, comfortable, moist, temperature controlled environment with which slugs like. And I have seen fields just devastated by slugs early in the season. This is a uh, cornfield uh, and this expanse of uh, stand loss that you see is from slug damage early in the season. And this is a soybean field simply devastated by slug feeding. So you might think, well, this is an early season pest, maybe seed treatments will help. Actually, it is the exact opposite. Oh, this is one of my favorite slug pictures. This is, um, this, is this crud that you're seeing on the mower head from an alfalfa cutting. Um, that's not plant residue, this is slugs. Pretty impressive. Here's the, here's the punchline. These neonic seed treatments actually make slug problems worse. They don't make it better. They actively make slug problems worse. This is a, an experiment showing uh, the number of slugs caught in traps in um, the soybean field over time from the middle of May to the middle of October. Uh, the blue line are the catches in um, fields that were not treated with an insecticidal seed treatment. And the red, which is higher, higher numbers of slugs are in fields that were treated with an insecticidal seed treatment. And we have a lot of data like this showing that slugs are worse when you have an insecticidal seed treatment. This is why it's an interesting story. Slugs are not insects, slugs are mollusks, like snails are mollusks. And so the insecticide does not kill the slugs. And the, instead the slug eats the plant that contains the insecticidal seed treatment and then it excretes it in its slime. The other important player in this story are ground beetles. The upper picture is an immature ground beetle. And then when it matures into an adult beetle, this is what it looked like. These are the lions of no-till agriculture. They are very, very important predators of slugs. So we have a food chain situation here. We have crops and then the slugs are feeding on the crops. 
mostly most slugs that we see are the gray garden slugs, but there are three other species you might encounter, marsh slugs, banded slugs, and dusky slugs. And in turn, we have the predators at the top of the food chain, the predators being the ground beetle. So I told you that this, the slug eats the plant, the plant has the seed treatment, the slug excretes the pesticide in its slime, along comes the predator, it eats the slug, it eats the toxic slug. The slug is toxic because it's excreting this insecticide and this is what happens uh, when you have a ground beetle after it's eaten a slug. So hopefully this movie will play. So this first is a normal beetle, very active, running around the dish, very, very scampering around, a lot of energy. This next is a ground beetle after it ate one of these toxic slugs. and it will eventually go on to die. So we've got a situation here where we're actually, by the using the insecticidal seed treatment, we're taking out the predators, which allows the slug populations to increase. So the take home points from this talk uh, are that the management window for insecticidal seed treatments is fairly short. Um, it is a good product for certain types of pests in certain types of situations. But if you are carefully examining your input costs, uh, consider your pest situation and whether you're getting your money's worth out of that investment in insecticidal seed treatments and make your decision whether it's worth that investment. And I, I do know, I do realize that it's not so easy to get seed that's not treated with an insecticidal seed treatment sometimes. It just comes with. And if you want seed without it, you have to order way, way earlier. You have to find the right supplier. There are, you know, there are some suppliers that will custom treat seed with what you uh, want or don't want. And um, if you find those folks, it might be worth your uh, investment to uh, do a little bit of a buffet approach to your witch seed treatments. Like maybe you absolutely have to have your fungicide. That is often the case, but maybe you don't really need that insecticide. I would really like to see a situation where every farmer purchasing seed does have kind of a buffet option. But until we get to that point, just be aware of um, what inputs you're using and what you're getting out of them. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the support of the uh, Soybean Checkoff, particularly Ohio Soybean Association and the North Central Soybean Research Program. Uh, that's my email address up there, tillman.1 at osu.edu. If you think of a question afterwards, just feel free to shoot me a line. And I'm happy to take your questions right now. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, here's a question in the Q&A. People are just saying thank you and that you've done a nice job, so. Oh, well, thank you. So thank you very much. And thank you all for your attention today. I think as I'm looking and not seeing questions that maybe it's a little late in the day for questions, but people have your email if they think of something later. Yes, um, by all means. I, I, I know this is the time of day you guys have been at it a long time today. So feel free to get in touch later when you got a little more pep. You've been a really good sport about being the last speaker of, of a long day. So thank you very much for that, Kelly. And thank you all for- oh, do, they, do they need their code for me? I do. I'm gonna pull it up in just a second. So um, here I just got a reminder, I'll have the recordings for today um, up on our YouTube channel next week. Um, so you can check that. I'll also be emailing it to all of you. So you'll get an email from me with that code. Um, we have a couple of events you might be interested in attending online next week, as well as several more throughout um, the winter. So you can check our website to see details about those events and others that are coming up. Um, 
I do just want to let you know that when um, at the end of the day, we're going to be sending a survey to you in your email. It'll not be coming from me or Amanda or Laura or anyone you heard from today. It will be coming from Brian Butler. He's our survey person. So he's going to be emailing you a survey and it really helps us if you fill that out and give us your input on what you want to see from us next time and what worked well for you. Um, we really want to create programs to deliver information to you that are what you want. So please, please fill that out for us. That really helps. Um, and that'll be coming to your email. Um, uh, so, Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt. I did have one more question come in um, with the wireworms, grubs, and um, seed corn maggots being a potential problem. I still, am I still recommending not using an insecticidal seed treatment? My answer is it depends. It depends if you routinely have those pests. Some people can go, you know, almost their whole careers and never have problems with those pests. So consider what your pest situation typically is on your farm. That's my answer there. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Thanks everybody. So thanks to Kelly again, and thanks to all of our speakers.